Welcome back, everyone, to 1301 U.S. History with Mr. Baxley at Como Picton in Northeast Texas Community College. Today, we're going to be learning all about life right after World War II, otherwise known as the Cold War and the 1950s. And before we get started today, this video was brought to you by Honey. Honey is not a Chrome extension. Honey is just this sweet stuff that bees make. Actually, not really. Honey is not the sponsor of this video. The sponsor of this video is me because no one's paying me and I'm doing this myself. Well, I guess the school is paying me, but this is something extra I'm doing for y'all. Anyways, so let's get started as we learn about the early Cold War and the 1950s. So in the last video, we learned all about World War II. This week, we are going to learn about life right after World War II and the conflicts that occurred immediately after the war. So let's swing back to the end of World War II. World War II was the largest war in world history by any metric, okay, other than the length of time. If you look at the number of people involved, number of casualties, the money spent, the explosives, like everything about World War II is pretty much the biggest war in world history, okay? There are a few exceptions, but in general, this war is absolutely just earth shattering. The whole world is different. The old powers of Germany and Japan and Britain and France are just either completely broken or weakened incredibly by the war. And new powers dominate the world, the United States and the Soviet Union. During World War II, we had worked together. And at the end, whenever the United States and Russia won against Germany and Japan, we were euphoric, extremely happy. But after those early celebrations died out, the reality of the new global power structure became evident. Once the dust settled, we realized that our former ally and friend, the Soviet Union, is now our chief rival for global power. The United States and the Soviet Union agreed that the Nazis were bad. But other than that, we didn't really agree on much. We had different economic systems. We had different political beliefs. We had different geopolitical goals. We had a different culture and we had different ideas for what the world should look like. And the 50 years following World War II are filled with economic, diplomatic, and often violent clashes between the United States and the Soviet Union or the USSR known as the Cold War. Why is it called the Cold War? Well, there's no actual war declared between the United States and the Soviet Union. The United States and the Soviet Union never go to full-scale official military conflict. Rather, we spend about 45 years really hating each other and doing everything we can to frustrate each other. And the world becomes divided into two halves. The United States and the free market world becomes known as the first world. And the Soviet Union and the communist totalitarian world becomes known as the second world. And then the third world, which is where you might have heard of the phrase third world country, first world problems. The third world refers to the countries in Africa and in South America and in Asia that were non-aligned between the United States and the Soviet Union. So let's go over this real quick, okay? The United States is a free market economy or capitalism. In that system, people are allowed to buy and sell things and own private property, okay? In capitalism, people have the right and freedom to own things. In communism, all possessions are to be shared by all the people in the whole country. But the way this works in actuality, like in principle, it sounds nice, everybody's sharing, but in actuality, the government of the country controls everything and the government runs everything, every business and every decision. In capitalism, we have the freedom to make economic decisions. I decided to become a teacher. You decide to apply for a job, you decide to buy something, you decide how to spend your money and how to make your money. In communism, the government makes those decisions. The government decides what job you have, the government decides what resources you get. In capitalism, when you want a car, you go to the car lot 
And based off of how much money you have, you decide how to spend your money to get the car that you want. In communism, if you want a car, you ask the government for a car, and the government decides whether or not they're going to give you a car, and then they decide which car you get. Okay, so in capitalism, we have freedom. And typically in the United States and free market countries, you see capitalism and democracy, governments that are elected by the people for the people to preserve their rights. In communism, you typically see totalitarian dictatorships, governments where people don't have rights and freedoms. In the Soviet Union, there's no freedom of speech. In the Soviet Union, there's no freedom of religion. In the Soviet Union, there's no freedom of movement. There's no freedom to have property. There's no freedom like uh, you have protections in courts and all those sorts of things. They don't have those freedoms. All they have is communism. And so the United States does not like communism. And for communists, they don't like capitalism. They view capitalism as evil. They think that capitalism, because of the fact that some people are richer and some people are poor, they think that that's wrong and they think everything should be distributed equally. And so communism wants to destroy capitalism and capitalism wants to destroy communism. So it's very difficult for the United States and the Soviet Union to get along or be friends. But the countries are so big and they're so powerful that if the United States and the Soviet Union actually went to war, it would destroy both countries. So rather than fighting head on, battles are fought through proxy wars. A proxy war is when someone fights on someone else's behalf. That's a proxy, someone who does something for you. So for example, if I was going to have a fight with, let's say, um, let's say I have a pick a fight with Mr. Folsom, okay? Mr. Folsom's another teacher at the school. I'm a teacher at the school. We could have a fight, but we could have a proxy battle if I picked one of my students and he picked one of his students and they duped it out. Now that obviously wouldn't happen. That's a joke. OK, but that's the idea. Rather than the two big people fighting, it's the two little people fighting for them. OK, imagine puppets. OK, you know, you've got a puppet on a puppet string and your puppet fights someone else. That's a proxy war. So the United States and the Soviet Union never fought each other directly. They had their students or their puppets or their little brothers, however you want to think of it. They had them do the fighting for them. So in places like Korea and Vietnam and Cuba, Grenada, Afghanistan, the United States and the Soviet Union fought each other indirectly. For example, in Korea, the United States had a puppet of South Korea. That's like my student, or that's like my little brother, or my puppet, or whatever. And they were fighting the Soviet Union's puppet of North Korea. Okay? And so both sides fought each other, but never directly. And every time we fought each other, we had one hand tied behind our back. Okay? That's a proxy war. Historically, the United States was hostile to communism and dictatorships. The Soviet Union was hostile to capitalism, and they didn't really like the United States. Many people in the Soviet Union felt that the United States had kind of done them wrong. During World War II, we took our time before we invaded France in D-Day. And the Soviet Union had been begging the United States to attack Germany for years before we finally invaded France in 1944. And during that time, the full force of the Nazi military was being brought to bear on the Soviet Union, pretty much. And so the Soviet Union resented the United States for that. During the middle of World War II, Russia, under their leader, Joseph Stalin, made promises during the Yalta Conference that after World War II, any countries that Russian troops were in would be set free. So during World War II, Germany had expanded and invaded Russia. Well, the Russians were driving them out. And when the Russians got them out of Russia, they kept on pushing towards Germany. And along the way, they overran countries like Poland and countries like in Eastern Europe, like Yugoslavia and places like that. And as the Russians were pushing their way through what was German territory, they installed communist governments. So Poland was supposed to go free, but as soon as the war was over, the Russians broke their promise and Poland was forced to become a communist country. Eastern Europe, along with many sections of Germany that was occupied by Russia, was forced to become communist puppet regimes of the Soviet Union. A puppet regime is a country that is under the control of another country, like puppets on a string. It looks like it's independent, 
but it's actually under the control of the Soviet Union. And the United States has puppets of our own, okay? And so these puppets are under the control of these larger countries, and they're using them for their own purposes. Here is the Iron Curtain, the line that divided Eastern and Western Europe. The blue countries are the countries with capitalist free market economies. These are the United States' allies, like Great Britain and France, Italy, Spain, Scandinavia. But also look here, countries like West Germany. See, this country right here is Germany, and Germany was cut in half. The Western part was on the United States side. But East Germany was under the control of the Soviet Union, along with Poland and Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, Yugoslavia, Albania, all these countries were part of the Russian communist sphere. And they were forced to become puppets of the Soviet Union. At the end of the war, <clears throat> the Allies realized that peace would be hard to keep with the old League of Nations. So the League of Nations has gotten rid of at the end of World War II. The big three, the leaders of the UK, Great Britain, the United States, and the Soviet Union, Winston Churchill, FDR, and Stalin had planned during the middle of World War II to create a new international peacekeeping body called the United Nations. <clears throat> and right at the end of World War II, there was enough cooperation. The United States and the Soviet Union were getting along just enough to create something new called the United Nations, which would be much stronger than the League of Nations. Remember, the United States refused to join the League of Nations after World War I. After World War II, we don't, we don't only join, we actually are the leaders of the United Nations. The United Nations headquarters are in New York City, in America, established in 1945. We're not going to get into all the details, but essentially the way the UN works is that every country gets one vote in the General Assembly. But that system is not enough. Because small countries, little tiny countries in the middle of, say, South America or East Asia or, you know, the small countries like little island nations out in the Pacific Ocean, they could outvote a country like the United States, even though it's much bigger, it's just one vote. So the way that the United Nations works is that any country that is part of the United Nations, excuse me, any country that's part of the United Nations has one vote in the General Assembly, but only large countries can be on the Security Council. The Security Council has five permanent members, okay? China, Russia, France, Great Britain, and America. And they have the power of veto, which means that if the General Assembly, the small countries vote to do something that the big countries don't like, then it can't happen. But because there is a General Assembly, the big countries can't do stuff that hurts the little countries because they could vote it out at the General Assembly. So what this does is it creates a balance of power between the large and the small countries so that there isn't this weak system. And if the United Nations decides to do something, that means that these big powers all agreed on it. So while the United Nations doesn't just do anything, a lot of times they just get locked up in arguing with themselves and they don't do much, but if they actually put their mind to something, that means the biggest countries in the world have their military, political, and economic power behind them. And that makes the UN much more effective. It's been effective enough that we haven't had a World War III. And that's not the only reason why we haven't had a World War III, but it's likely to be part of it. Now, even though we create the United Nations and there is some cooperation with Russia, the United States is very, very concerned at the beginning of uh, the years of right after World War II. It seems like communism's expansion is unstoppable. Like dominoes, countries all over Eastern Europe fall to communism, they get occupied by Russian soldiers, they start adopting communist governments, and they start getting rid of any elements of capitalism, and they become puppets of the Soviet Union. And it just seems like it can't stop. It seems like all these countries are falling apart. And this is partially because World War II was so devastating. There was so much destruction in World War II that countries had to rebuild. And Russia was offering help to a lot of countries to help them rebuild. But when they took that money and they took that assistance, it came along with the price tag of becoming communist. 
So President Harry Truman is the president at the end of World War II and the beginning of the Cold War, and he decides that we must stop vulnerable countries from falling to communism. And he sets up two major policies that are incredibly important. The first one is called containment. This is the strategy of the United States during the Cold War. This is the most important word in this lecture. So make sure that whenever you leave a comment telling me you watch this, that you say containment. Make sure you mention containment in your comment because containment is the most important strategy for the United States in the Cold War. Why is it important? It's also known as the Truman Doctrine, but it was the strategy that the United States would stop the spread of communism. We will not attack countries already under communist rule, but a country that is trying to stop communism from spreading, we're gonna help, okay? So Poland, it's too late for them. They got communism, they're communist, we can't save them. But if communism tries to spread to Greece, we're going to stop it. Look here. Let's look right here. Okay. So these red countries, it's too late. They're too far gone. It's over. We can't help them. But if any of these blue countries, if this red tries to spread over here, you try to bring communism over to Austria, we're going to say no. If you try to bring communism to Italy, we're going to say no. And we'll do anything we can to stop it. That's containment. That is why we go to war in Korea. That's why we go to war in Vietnam. It's why we do all these crazy things during the Cold War is containment. This is our strategy. We are going to stop the infection from spreading. It's kind of like a quarantine. We're going to try to stop this disease of communism from spreading to the rest of the world. In 1947 alone, the United States spent $400 million trying to stop communist rebellions in Greece and Turkey. Look back here. This is Turkey. This is Greece, okay? The communism was trying to spread to them, so we give money to these countries to help them fight against communist rebels, to support their military in fighting against communism to keep it from spreading. And it works. Greece and Turkey do not become communist, and they remain our allies to this day. The second part of Harry Truman's efforts is something called the Marshall Plan. The Marshall Plan was created by Secretary of State George Marshall on June 5th, 1947. He was a general during World War II, but after World War II, he becomes Secretary of State, and his plan is to rebuild Europe. During World War II, much of Europe was destroyed, and $17 billion, over $17 billion, gets sent to rebuild the economy of, and infrastructure of Western Europe to prevent those countries from being so weak that they would fall to communism. Countries like Italy, West Germany, France, places like that, they took money from the Marshall Plan to help them rebuild so they would be strong, they wouldn't fall to communism, and they would become our friends. That's one way to make friends is to start throwing money around. Now, if you run out of money, your friends might go away. But if you don't mind spending the money, you can probably buy some fake friends. And we buy some friends with the Marshall Plan, and those people become our allies during the Cold War. Now, Germany is the most complex part of this equation. You see, when World War II ended, the United States was coming from the West, the Russians are coming from the East, and they meet together in the middle of Germany. And basically where those, those soldiers met, that's where Germany was divided. Germany was divided into four zones. You have the British, French, U.S. zone, and the Russian zone. This was supposed to be temporary. The goal was to go through the country, get rid of all the Nazi stuff, get rid of Hitler, get rid of his government, and rebuild Germany and make it a democracy. But Russia didn't like that. Russia did not want Germany to be free. Russia did not like Germany, and they wanted to punish Germany for World War II. And so Russia kept their section, East Germany, and forced it to become a communist puppet of the Soviet Union. Now, what makes this complicated is Berlin. Berlin is the capital of Germany, and Berlin was in the Russian zone. But within the city of Berlin, the Allies had divided it up into four sectors, the U.S., British, French, and Russian. So West Berlin 
is under the control of these guys, and East Berlin is under control of the Russians, and the Allies, Britain, France, and the America, they combine their sections to form West Germany and West Berlin, and they become an island of democracy in the middle of a sea of communism, okay? And Joseph Stalin, the leader of the Soviet Union, hated this. He did not like the fact that there was democracy and capitalism in the middle of his little kingdom. And so he sealed off all the land routes to the city on June 1948. He blockaded the city of Berlin to force the people of Berlin to starve and submit to communism. Okay? Now, this is a moment where we could have gone to war with Russia. Okay? Because we want to contain communism. We are not going to let communism spread, even if it's only one city. We are not half a city. We are not going to let communism spread. So, Harry Truman has to make a decision. Should he let Berlin fall and become part of communism? Should he go to war with Russia and risk millions of lives? Or could he try something different? And that's what he does. The third option is something known as the Berlin Airlift. The Russians blocked off the land routes, but the United States sent airplanes to Berlin and provided supplies by air for around 13 months. It's around a year that this goes on before the Russians finally say, oh, it's 11 months, right there, I'm sorry. 11 months, for 11 months, the United States airlift supplies to Berlin to keep them alive long enough for the Russians to realize, okay, they're not giving up. We'll let them have it. And so what happens for the rest of the Cold War is that the only way you can get into Berlin, there's one road and one railroad, and then there's three air routes. And that's how the United States keeps West Berlin supplied throughout the Cold War. And West Berlin remains an island of democracy for the rest of the Cold War in the middle of East Germany, which is communist. And Germany stays divided until 1990, okay? So a lot of communists try to escape. A lot of communists in East Germany, they don't like communism. Here's something that you can think about. There's a lot of people today that want to bring communism back or socialism or things like that. Well, the evidence for why communism and socialism doesn't work is right here in East Germany. It was so bad that people were willing to risk their lives to get to West Berlin to freedom. If the Russians caught someone trying to get into West Berlin, they would kill them. And eventually they build a wall around West Berlin to keep people from escaping to freedom there. But that divided city becomes a symbol of the division of the world between the free and the communist world. Now, in response to the Russian expansion of communism, the United States creates an alliance system called NATO, North Atlantic Treaty Organization. This was formed in April of 1949, and this is a mutual defense treaty. Every one of these blue countries is in a mutual defense treaty. That means that they are going to defend each other. So if the Russians try to capture West Germany, all these blue countries are going to go to war with Russia. If the Russians try to capture Greece, everybody's going to defend each other. Britain, France, Spain, Portugal, Italy, Germany, all these people are all going to war. You mess with one of us, you get all of us. This is kind of like World War I, that alliance system. It's come back, and it's come back even bigger than before because the Russians respond with something called the Warsaw Pact. All these red countries are in the Warsaw Pact. If you mess with one of them, you mess with all of them. So this sets up a situation a lot like World War I, where if Greece and Bulgaria get in a fight, everybody's getting in a fight. So this is a kind of scary situation, and it gets even worse. Because in 1949, Russia gets the atomic bomb. From 1945 to 1949, only the United States had the atomic bomb, and this gave us a major advantage in the Cold War. But there were actual spies in America that were Russians that stole American secrets and gave them to the Russians. And the Russians had scientists of their own that had been researching the atomic bombs, and they were able to develop their own atomic bomb in 1949. 
And this changes the whole game. Because when you fight a war with atomic bombs, nobody wins. If your bullets can blow up a whole city, you can shoot four or five of them and ruin a whole country, okay? If the United States and the Soviet Union get into a war, everybody's dead. You don't win a Cold War that's a nuclear war. Nobody wins. If you play a nuclear war, you're going to lose. Even if you win, you're going to lose. Because let's say we get in a nuclear war and we completely annihilate all of Russia. They're still going to get off a few bombs and shoot at us. And if we lose just a couple cities, we're still going to have all the radioactive fallout that comes from a nuclear bomb that's going to give people cancer and mutate things. It's going to be a bad time. There's no way you win a nuclear war. So now the United States has a serious fear, okay? If we get in a fight, we're going to get them back. If they hit us, we're going to hit them back. If we hit them, they're going to hit us back. So nobody wants to be the first person to throw a punch. Nobody wants to be the guy that starts it. And now we have this situation where it's a standoff. It's a game of chicken. Both sides are coming at each other, and somebody's got to pull out, or else everybody's going to die. You don't win a game of chicken if you both hit each other, okay? And that's what's happening in the Cold War. That's why we never go to full-scale war with Russia, because we know that both sides know. The Russians and the Americans both know that there's no good ending if we go to full-scale war. Even though we hate each other, we can't fight each other. That's why we use those puppets. That's why we have those proxy wars. That's why we have those people that fight on our behalf. Because we want to fight, but we can't. Now, this becomes a problem in Asia. Asia was a much more difficult location to contain communism than in Europe, okay? The Soviet Union occupied the northern half of Korea at the end of World War II, and they instituted a communist puppet regime there led by Kim Il-sung, who is Kim Jong-un's, I believe his grandpa or his great-grandpa. Yeah, it's his great-grandpa, okay? So... Same family is still in charge of North Korea that was installed by the communists, okay? So Kim Jong-un is there today, the dictator of North Korea, because of the Soviet Union. They put his great-grandpa or his grandpa in charge, and he inherited the throne. In 1949, China goes through a communist revolution. Now, China becomes communist, but they're not necessarily friends with Russia. China is like a whole different flavor of communism and they hate Russia, and Russia hates China, but they're both communists, and the United States does not like either of them. So that's the biggest country on the earth, as far as population goes, all of a sudden becomes communist? That's not good. That's very scary for the United States. And so South Korea becomes a bastion of democracy. Communist North and the Free South of Korea are divided along the 38th parallel or latitude line. But on June 25th, 1950, North Korean soldiers invade the South. Now they are secretly backed up by the Soviet Union and China. They're carrying weapons that were made by the Soviet Union and China, and they're backed up by soldiers that are either Russian or Chinese, okay? And they invade the South Koreans on June 25th, 1950, and the United States goes to defend South Korea. They lead a massive coalition of nations that defend South Korea with the backing of the United Nations. Most of the troops, though, in South Korea were either South Koreans or the United States. Here's four maps of the Korean War. It kind of shows you what happened at the beginning. The North and South Korea are divided along 38th parallel. The North Koreans invade, and they get close to conquering all of South Korea. But then on September 14, 1950, the United States lands at Incheon, and they march up north and almost take out North Korea. But then on November 25, 1950, the Chinese jump in, and now it becomes a war between the United States and China, but fighting through South Korea and North Korea, and it becomes a stalemate. And it goes back and forth and back and forth and back and forth until it finally devolves into a stalemate along this line on July 27, 1953. And that is the line that divides South and North Korea today. Okay, it's stuck there. To avoid the Korean War going to a global nuclear war, 
both China and the United States pull their punches. We don't use the full force of our military. We don't use our nuclear weapons we, and we, we hold ourselves back. And so since we're holding ourselves back, we can't actually win. And the war devolves into a stalemate or a tie. <clears throat> the leader of the United States soldiers is General Douglas MacArthur. And he hates the fact that he's being held back. He is mad at President Truman for not giving him permission to just do whatever he wants. And he says that the only reason why we can't win the Korean War is because of politics. And so he criticizes the president of the United States for his approach to the war. And President Truman says, you're not going to do this. You're not going to make, you're not going to criticize me to newspapers. I'm in charge. And so MacArthur gets fired and the war continues to be a stalemate. The front line realigns basically to where the war started, very close to where the war starts, and the ceasefire negotiations actually last for two years before a temporary armistice was finally signed on July 27, 1953. Technically, the Korean War is still going on today. There has not been a peace treaty. North Korea and South Korea are not at peace. They're at a ceasefire. They're not shooting at each other, but they're not at peace. <clears throat> so North Korea today remains a communist dictatorship and South Korea remains a free market democracy. If you want to see a reason that democracy and capitalism is better than communism, I would refer you to look at a picture of North and South Korea at night. North Korea today at night is completely dark. There's no lights. There's no cities. There's no, like, it's just, it's ridiculous. South Korea is this huge country full of, of, of technology and economics and freedom and the people are prosperous and in North Korea people are starving and suffering and it's terrible. Communism doesn't work and the free market democracy does and to protect South Korea and to protect their freedom over 37,000 Americans died. Let me show you a little picture right here. Let's just that's just for fun. Let's just do it, okay? So, look here. Korea at night. Well, look here. This is what I'm talking about right here. So, here's China. Here's South Korea. You see that right there, North Korea? That right there, is Pyongyang, the capital. Look at how much more developed South Korea is. Look at how underdeveloped North Korea is. This is what 50, 60 years of communism does to you. This is what 50, 60 years of capitalism does, okay? I'll let you guys figure out which one's better. All right. <clears throat> now, after World War II, the United States had to transition back to a peacetime economy. There's kind of a worry that there'll be inflation or economic disruption. And so to help the economy get back on track after war, the United States passes something called the GI Bill or the Servicemen's Readjustment Act of 1944. This gives government loans to veterans who want to build homes, start businesses, or go to college. So if you fought in World War II, you survived, you get a sweet deal. The government will help you buy a house, start a business, or go to college. And so this leads to a boom in the economy. People go home and they get to work. All across the country, people start building houses. They start getting jobs. And there's a boom, not just in the economy, there's a boom in the birth rate. There's literally something called the baby boom, where you have millions of babies being born during this time period, okay? Soldiers come back home from war. They haven't seen their wife or their girlfriend in a long time. They get married. They build a house. They start having kids, okay? And this baby boom creates a generation called the baby boomers, which today are old people, okay? If you've ever heard the phrase, okay, boomer, that's referring to old people born after World War II because after World War II, there is a boom in the birth rate, okay? In 1946, the United States passes a law called the Atomic Energy Act, which gives the government a monopoly over nuclear material, which is probably a good thing. We don't want just anybody making nuclear bombs in their backyards and stuff like that. The War Department becomes known as the Defense Department. The United States creates organizations like the National Security Council, 
and the Central Intelligence Agency to coordinate our efforts during the Cold War. This is where we create spies, okay? The Central Intelligence Agency is the spy agency for the United States. It's we spy on the Russians, they spy on us. There's a lot of things that happen in the Cold War that no one even really knows about. There's a lot of fights that probably happened and a lot of people that probably died that you'll probably never read about in a history book. But the people that were doing it, these guys, okay? And so that's all we're gonna talk about there. Now let's move on to the next PowerPoint. And let's talk about that decade after World War II known as the 50s. So when we come to like the culture of the United States after World War II, many people refer to the 50s as like happy days or the, the best time in American history, okay? Many people look back on the 1950s with nostalgia. Nostalgia is when you look back on your past and you remember it as better than it actually was. Have you ever thought about how like cartoons were just funnier when you were a kid or toys were cooler when you were a kid than the toys kids have today or the games you played when you were a kid are better than the games that kids play today? That's nostalgia. Your games were just as lame as the kids today, okay? Your TV shows were just as lame as the shows kids watch today. It, it, it's always been lame. But you remember it as better because you were a kid and you look back on the past with those rose colored glasses and warm fuzzy feelings like, oh man, wasn't that so cool, okay? That's nostalgia. And many people look back on the 1950s and they think of it as just this perfect time when everything was great, okay? the perfect American family of the Beavers, uh, I'm sorry, of the Cleavers, and leave it to Beaver. Ward and June and their little kids, Wally and Beaver, you know, such perfect little family, everything's so happy. Everybody's got a nice house with a white picket fence and, you know, life is just great, okay? That's like the image that the 1950s had. And it's a time of political moderation. It's a time when you have like presidents like Dwight Eisenhower, who just about everybody liked, okay? His, his, uh, his slogan was, I like Ike. And he was beloved by Republicans and Democrats. The 1950s was a period of economic boom, okay? There was a lot of money being made. That GI Bill put a lot of people to work. A lot of homes were built. A lot of businesses were started. People went to college. The economy was roaring. But the 1950s is not a perfect time. In fact, there were a lot of problems in the 1950s, especially for people who did not conform to the dominant culture. Especially if you were communists, okay? The 1950s was not very kind to you if you were a socialist or if you were a little too liberal or if you had ever been a communist before. There was a lot of anti-communist paranoia. People are worried about the Cold War, they're worried about a nuclear war, and they're very worried about spies. Remember, there were actual spies in America that had actually brought American nuclear secrets and given them to the Soviet Union to help them build atomic bombs. So if those spies are real, who's to say that there aren't more? Who's to say that your neighbor's not a spy? Who's to say that you're not a spy? Can you prove that you're loyal? These questions were asked all across the country by people who were afraid that communism was gonna control the country. And this fear of communism, this red scare, was led by a man named Senator Joseph McCarthy. In fact, it was so associated with Senator Joseph McCarthy that the fear of communism becomes known as McCarthyism, okay? Senator Joseph McCarthy was a Republican senator who became famous as he led a public search to find hidden communists in the government. If scientists that worked on the nuclear program were spies enough to give up our secrets, who's to say that your representative isn't a communist? Who's to say that that general isn't a communist? Who's to say this or that? And so Joseph McCarthy would accuse military officers, government officials, even movie stars and musicians and celebrities. He accused them of being communists. And he would have public hearings in Congress that were put on television where he would publicly disgrace people as communists, often without evidence. A lot of this was hearsay. A lot of it was accusations with no evidence whatsoever. Guilt by association. Your uncle was a communist, so you're a communist, okay? If you remember, when we talked about the 1930s, and even before that, 
there were communists in America, people like Eugene V. Debs. He was a socialist that had ran for president back during the turn of the century, and millions of people had voted for him, okay? If there was a socialist running for president back in the year 1900, 1940 is not that long away. So there's probably people still alive in America in the 1940s that remember Eugene V. Debs and maybe even voted for him, or at least your parents might have voted for him or your grandparents. Now, Eugene V. Debs might have been a socialist, but he wasn't a Russian. He was totally different. But that was enough for Joseph McCarthy. If your grandpa had voted for Eugene V. Debs, you might as well be Russian. Okay, and so he accused a lot of people of being communists that were not. And his witch hunts would just go across the country and ruin people's lives. Okay, it continued until 1954. His hearings were televised and he would just publicly out people as communists. And even if you weren't guilty, some people were communists, but a lot of these people were not. They might have known a communist or they might have read a communist book, or maybe they just had a red flag or something at their house. If you were associated with being a communist, it was enough to ruin your life. People would get blacklisted, okay? Being blacklisted means that no one else would hire you. If you were associated with communism, nobody's going to hire you. No one's going to vote for you. You're not going to get a promotion. Your life is over, okay? You're never going to get promoted. You're never going to get a new job because no one wants to hire a communist spy. And even if you're proven innocent, that thought's always going to be in the back of the mind. Are they really a communist or are they really not? I don't know. I, let's just not even hire them. Let's find someone else. And so Joseph McCarthy ruined a lot of people's lives until a U.S. Army lawyer named Joseph Welch just one day just got up in the middle of Congress on television and just said, hey, stop it. I believe the exact words he said is something like, have you no sense of decency? Because Joseph McCarthy was accusing like this young man who was like a young man in the army. He was moving up through the ranks. And Joseph McCarthy just accused them of being communists with no evidence. And then that stained his record and it would hurt him from ever having a promotion the rest of his life. And Joseph Welch was like, you're just being a jerk. Just stop it. And finally, the public was like, okay, we've had enough. Eventually, people got over the paranoia. At the very beginning of the Cold War, people were really freaked out. But by 1954, People had calmed down from the initial panic and they were like, okay, we're tired of this. But anyone who had resisted the investigations before this happened could be blacklisted from this job, especially celebrities. There were in fact a lot of movie stars and celebrities whose lives were ruined because they were associated with communism. Now, were there communists in America? Yes. But most of them were former communists during the 1930s. During the 1930s, it was more socially acceptable to be communist. The communists, that those were like American communists. They might have wanted to take away private property and establish communism, but they weren't Russians, okay? And while some Soviet spies did exist at the upper levels of the U.S. government, the vast majority of people that were accused of being communists were not, and thousands of people lost their jobs and had their reputations tarnished. Now, after World War II, a lot of people moved out of the city and into suburbs, okay? We talk about this idea of the American dream. What does it mean? What is the American dream? It means different things to different people. But typically you get this idea that in America, no matter what your background is, if you work hard enough and you do what's right, you'll be able to live a comfortable middle-class lifestyle, to have your own home and your own family and to be financially independent and to live a happy life. And after World War II, that becomes accessible to a lot of people. Thanks to the GI Bill, thanks to the booming economy, there's a lot of people who have enough money to buy homes, to be homeowners, to move out of the city and stop renting apartments, stop living in those tenements and those crowded cities, and move out into kind of into the country and drive back and forth to work and to have your own little slice of land, with your own little house, your own little dog, your two and a half kids, and your white picket fence, okay? And this suburbia comes into America, and it's created by different things. One thing that actually creates suburbia is racial fears, okay? There's a lot of diversity in the city. There's a lot of African Americans in the city. There's a lot of Hispanic Americans. There's different people from different countries moving into the city. And some people leave the city to get away from that. 
Okay. There's a lot of racism in America and there's a lot of people that don't like the idea of living near people that are different from them. And this is a phenomenon called white flight, especially when we start talking about integration and schools being integrated and black students and white students going to school together. You see a lot of suburbs created as white people run away to not go to school with black children. And this is a serious problem in America because suburbs tend to be very white and they tend to be dominated by white culture and they become bastions for racism, okay, where people can pretend that diversity doesn't exist. But another reason why suburbia is created is affordable housing. It's easier to buy land in the country and build a house on it than it is to buy an apartment in the city. It's more affordable, there's more land available. And for some people, they just wanna get out of the city. The city's loud, the city's crowded. In many cases, there's higher crime rates, there's higher, you know, higher rates of problems, like you know, there's more risk of fire and traffic and all sorts of things in the city than out in the country. And so a lot of people just wanna leave out of the city. Houses become easier to produce during the 1950s as you see more manufactured style houses, which are pioneered by a guy named William Levitt, who made like manufactured houses in Long Island, where he kind of made a factory, but for houses. Every house in this neighborhood was the same. These cookie cutter houses where each one looks like each other, it's really easy to produce and you see a lot of them being created. And this kind of gets this idea of keeping up with the Joneses, you know. Mrs. Jones has this nice house. We need to have a nice house, honey. Mrs. Jones has a new toaster. We need to have a new toaster. And a lot of the suburbs is based off of materialism. Having nice things. Having nicer things than they have. Having better things than this person. This materialism becomes a big part of what makes the 50s tick. The most important invention in the 1950s is the TV. But the TV wasn't invented in the 1950s. Kind of like radio, how radio was not invented in the 20s, but it become, became a really big deal in the 1920s. TV was invented a lot earlier than the 50s, but in the 50s, it really took over America. In 1945, only a few thousand Americans owned televisions. By 1955, nearly two thirds of American households had a television. And television becomes this massive, massive part of our lives, okay? Today, we spend a huge chunk, if not most of our lives, it seems, looking at screens. Like right now, we're looking at a screen. It's what we do all our lives. And this really begins in the 1950s. By 1955, we have nearly two-thirds of American households have a television, and we reorient our lives towards television. Okay? Television becomes a powerful political tool. Politicians realize that they can use TV to reach directly into American living rooms. Like FDR used the radio to talk directly to American people, the American politicians in the 1950s started using TV to directly address the American people. The TV president that we most associate with the early TV is actually John F. Kennedy, and we should talk about him later on. But John F. Kennedy, part of the reason why he became president, why he won the 1960 election is because of television. He won a televised debate that really sold his message to the American people, okay? Television takes a lot of the concepts of theater, of vaudeville, of radio, and remakes them into a new format, okay? The, a lot of TV producers learn lessons from the radio, okay? They make money through advertisements, and so they put programs on television that people want to watch, and while they're watching them, they put on commercials, and those commercials help sell goods. And so TV becomes a powerful way to make money. One of the early forms of entertainment that gets pioneered by television is situational comedies, what you might know of as sitcoms, okay, where you have a recurring cast, the same people over and over again. They have short episodes. Instead of a movie that has one story that happens over the course of a whole movie to a certain set of characters, and then it's over, a sitcom never really ends. It's like a day in the life of people. And it just like goes through the little daily adventures that people have as they're put in different situations and it's funny. The most, the most famous of these is I Love Lucy, which in 1953 had 44 million people watching it on a weekly, uh, weekly viewers in 1953. Those early TV families like the Cleavers and Leave It to Beaver were really like perfect, okay? 
in Leave it to Beaver, we have Ward Cleaver. He's, you know, the manly man who works in the office. He comes home every day to find June Cleaver, his wife, vacuuming in her pearls and making dinner. And they have these two little kids, you know, Wally and Beaver, and they're just cute. And they have little adventures. And, like, the biggest problem in the show is, like, you know, Beaver wrecked his bike. Oh man, that's so bad. But these little situational comedies, they had these perfect families who had these perfect little lives. And for many people, it was really hard to live up to. You know, it made a lot of people feel bad, like we need our life to be better. And so a lot of the 1950s is people trying to show off their wealth and try to strive to be like what everyone else is trying to be. Like, oh, everyone else has got a new dishwasher. I have to buy a new dishwasher. And by the way, there's an advertisement for a dishwasher in the middle of the TV show. Well, that's what we need to go do. And so all this is designed to help people make money. But much of TV is not just about situational comedies. There's also a lot of TV that harkens back to the good old days, like the Wild West, okay? <clears throat> There's a lot of Westerns in the 50s, like the Roy Rogers Show, Bonanza, Rawhide, Davy Crockett, Gunsmoke, a lot of these old TV shows, and you could look these up if you want to. A lot of these are kind of in a response to the Cold War. In the Cold War, the enemy is scary. During the Cold War, people live with the reality that at any moment, we could just go to nuclear war and all die in a second, okay? You can't hide from a nuclear bomb. A lot of people would build fallout shelters in their backyards or practice hiding under their desks at school. But in reality, at any moment, you could die. So many people look back at the Old West and they say, wasn't that a nice time when you could see the person trying to shoot you? And in the Old Western shows, you know, there's very clearly marked good guys wear white hats and bad guys wear black hats. And the good guy always shoots the bad guy and the bad guy always dies. And those Old Westerns today, people watch them and they seem predictable and they seem boring. But that was comforting to many people and they enjoyed that because... The good guys were good. The bad guys were bad. You didn't have to worry about communist spies or nuclear bombs. It, was, it felt like it was simpler. And so many people look at these old Westerns and they, they really feel comforted by them. these clear good guys, clear bad guys. But TV wasn't just for Westerns and sitcoms, okay? There were variety shows. Variety shows were a lot like vaudeville acts in your living room, okay? Some of the early variety shows were like Bob Hope. Sid Caesar, The Ed Sullivan Show. If you think about TV today, these are people like, uh, what's his name? Stephen Colbert, uh, Jimmy Fallon, Jimmy Kimmel, those late night talk shows. That's, that's a variety show. You have a host, he tells jokes, he has guests come on, he interviews them, he has a musical act, stuff like that is really popular. There's a lot of musical performances and a lot of artists that are introduced to the country through variety shows like Elvis and the Beatles. Commercials pay for TV and TV outperforms radio within the decade, it takes over. And a lot of people get their news from the television, okay? News channels uh, become, or rather news becomes a big part of American life. And one of the most famous newscasters, a guy named Edward R. Murrow, he, his reporting is a lot of what got rid of Joseph McCarthy. But there's also programming for children, okay? And there's programs like the Mickey Mouse Club and Howdy Doody that are uh, shows made for kids during the 1950s. Now, one thing you have to remember, in the 1950s, there were not as many channels. There's like two or three. Maybe if you live in a big city, there might be like five or six, maybe more. Okay. But these TV shows were a unifying experience for people. Everybody across the country watched the same shows. Everybody across the country watched the same news shows. Today, there's different news for different, different types of people, okay? Today, if you're conservative, you go watch Fox. If you're liberal, you go watch MSNBC. If you, all you care about is sports news, you watch the sports ESPN. If all you care about is news about music, you can watch that channel, okay? But during the 1950s, news had to cater to everyone because everybody was watching the same channel. So the news shows were much more neutral. They didn't spin to the conservatives or spin to the liberals. They tried to make everybody happy. The shows were much more generic. Today, they're specific entertainment. If you really like slime, there's a channel on YouTube for you. If you are a really big fan of obscure, you know, Norwegian 
art to music. There's a music channel for you. You know, like there's niches today that you can find thanks to the internet. But back during the 1950s, there's only two or three channels. So if a TV show wants to perform well, it has to be acceptable to lots of people. So the programming was much more generic. And so TV channels would have hours slotted for kids, hours slotted for Westerns, hours slotted for news shows, hours slotted for variety shows, and it would all be on the same channel and it would rotate through the program, okay? So it was a little different back then, but it was a unifying experience. Everyone across the country was talking about I Love Lucy. When I Love Lucy had the episode where she had her baby, everybody across the country was talking about it the next day okay so it was a unifying experience that brought the country oddly together and one thing it did is it totally changed our culture here's one way tv changed our culture look right here the tv dinner introduced in 1954 changing the way we eat tv does and even today look at a grocery store how much of our food is designed to be eaten while we're looking at a screen now, the music that is most associated with, associated with the 1950s is rock and roll. Rock and roll has its roots in African-American blues and gospel music, but it wasn't super popular with white people at the beginning, okay? But music producers knew that rock and roll would be popular with the average American, but there was so much racism and stigma and people were unwilling to give black artists a chance that they needed an ambassador for rock and roll. And they found it in Elvis Presley. Elvis Presley was white, which meant that he would be able to get past the color barrier that prevented a lot of African Americans from becoming famous. There was just so much racism in America. The African American rock and roll artists weren't able to break out into the mainstream. So Elvis Presley had that for him, but he was also a really good musician, okay? He could successfully embody the sounds of rhythm and blues. And so Elvis Presley becomes a massive hit, okay? Elvis Presley starts singing rock and roll on the radio. He starts going on television shows. And his deep voice and his gyrating hips lead to a massive demand for rock and roll. Once people start listening to rock and roll and it becomes popular in the 1950s, they're ready to listen to it from anyone. And so there's a lot of doors open to African-American and white performers to enjoy success. And you have a lot of rock and roll artists after Elvis Presley who are African-American who become popular across the whole country. Okay, You have artists both black and white like Little Richard, Buddy Holly, Jerry Lee Lewis, early, early rock and roll artists that are very influential for music for the rest of the century. Now, you ought to take some time and look at some old videos of Elvis Presley singing, and you'll notice that a lot of times they don't like to film him below his waist because Elvis Presley would shake his hips back and forth. And for many people, that was too much. While rock and roll was popular to a lot of people, there were many people who thought of rock and roll as the devil's music, okay? Rock and roll was really popular with the youth of America, and their enjoyment of rock and roll was increased by the fact that older Americans hated it, okay? Think about the things that you love today that your parents hate. Isn't it kind of fun to like something that your parents think is dumb, you know? Like your parents might not understand, I don't know, I don't even understand, but you know, like TikTok or whatever, you know, that's the coolest thing for the kids these days, and old people are like, what is a TikTok? And that makes it even more fun because old people don't understand it. So this is our thing. Well, that was rock and roll. Okay. The old people were like, you stop that rock and roll. And then kids are like, you can't tell me what to do. Skateboarding is not a crime. That sort of thing. You know, that young idea of like, I want to make old people mad. That fueled a lot of rock and roll. Okay. Rock and roll was associated with lower class people. It was associated with like, you know, poverty a little bit. It was associated with African Americans and also the sexual provocativeness of rock and roll led many across the nation to proclaim it as Satan's music. And some people tried to ban rock and roll and they said, that's the devil's music. And these are the same people today, the same people that really loved rock and roll back in those days are a lot of the people today that say that rap is bad, that sort of thing. You know, it just, it never ends. One day, your kids are going to have a form of music that you think is so stupid, and they're going to love it. And you're like, this is the dumbest music ever. Why can't you listen to good music? And they'll be like, you can't tell me what to do, Dad. 
I'm going to play my own music that's dumb and you're going to hate it. It's going to happen. Okay, that's my prediction. Anyway, you can meet back up with me in like 20 years and tell me how it goes. But my, my prediction, your kids are going to have some music or some app that you're going to think is the dumbest thing in the world and they're going to love it and there's nothing you can do about it. We'll see. We'll see who's right. Okay. But anyways, rock and roll was unable to be banned, obviously. It was so successful. It made so much money that rock and roll overtook any efforts to ban it. And so rock and roll takes over the whole country. Now, while people are having fun rocking and rolling, the 1950s sees continuing escalation in the Cold War. Old empires like Britain and France are falling apart after World War II. And all those old colonies in Africa and Asia start to break apart. And the British leave and the French leave and those countries become independent. And as those countries become independent, it's time to decide, are you gonna be a capitalist country or are you gonna be a communist country? It's like when a new kid moves into the school and everyone's like, okay, are you gonna be our friend or are you gonna be that group's friend, okay? The United States and the Soviet Union tried to build alliances with these new countries. And across nearly every third world country, it seems like there's some proxy war as capitalists and communists fight it out to see who is going to be in control. One of the biggest allies of the United States comes during 1948 as Britain leaves the Middle East and France leaves the Middle East, a lot of new countries are created, and one of these countries is Israel. Israel, in 1948, becomes a country, and the United States supports it. Israel becomes one of our best allies. However, the Arab nations around Israel oppose the very existence of Israel, and it leads to a lot of wars where the United States supports Israel, and the Soviet Union supports the countries around them. Israel wins every war that it fights in the 20th century extremely well. They whip everybody, and the United States helps them out, okay? And it's blessed the United States immensely having that ally and having the blessings that comes with that ally. Now, after Harry Truman ends his presidency, Dwight D. Eisenhower becomes president. Dwight D. Eisenhower was a moderate Republican. He was well-liked by both sides. In fact, the Democrats tried to get him to run for president, too. He was not really a super conservative. He was not super liberal. He was kind of a middle-of-the-road kind of guy. And he was so popular because he had been the leader of the Allies' military during World War II. And so Dwight D. Eisenhower won because he was such a famous general during World War II. Everybody liked him. And he led the United States in the Cold War with something called the Eisenhower Doctrine. Okay, and this was basically the Truman Doctrine, but applied to the Middle East. Eisenhower did not want communism spreading to the Middle East. And so, whenever the new government of Egypt, as Egypt became independent of the United Kingdom, they got into a conflict over the Suez Canal. The United States really didn't get involved in that particular fight, but the United States pledged their support to any government fighting communists in the Middle East. We didn't want to get involved in colonial wars but we wanted any new countries in the Middle East to be capitalist. As a result, when Lebanon had a little bit of a threat of communist takeover, the United States sent 5,000 troops to Lebanon to keep them from going communist. So we are not isolated anymore. Isolationism is over. The Cold War ends isolationism. We get involved in everybody's business. Lebanon is this tiny little country in the Middle East, and we send 5,000 soldiers over there because we are not going to let them be communists. We are not going to let communism spread. That's how dedicated we are to contain it. And Eisenhower was not afraid to threaten the use of nuclear weapons. In Asia, the United States threatened nuclear war with, Thai with China over the island of Taiwan. Taiwan is an island off the coast of China where whenever China became communist, a lot of the people in China escaped communism and went to Taiwan. China claims Taiwan as part of China, and Taiwan claims to be the real China. Okay, so there's actually like two countries called China in the world today. I got a funny story about that that you can ask me whenever we come back to school. But anyways, China, they want control over Taiwan, and the United States threatens to nuke China if they try to take over uh, Taiwan, and China backs away. This is called brinksmanship. You see, Eisenhower 
love the concept of mutually assured destruction. Mutually assured destruction is this idea, also known as MAD, M-A-D, that if one side goes to war, everybody's going to die. And so he would use that as a threat. He would say, China, if you try to take Taiwan, we're all going to die. So you better back off. And so Eisenhower built up the nuclear arsenal of the United States so that no one would threaten to attack us. His idea was if we have tons of nukes, nobody's going to mess with us because they're going to get blown up. That was his plan. To supplement, now the nukes are the big heavy fist, but sometimes you need a knife, and that's the CIA. The Central Intelligence Agency was created to assist the Cold War effort. It's a government agency dedicated to gathering information on the Soviet Union, communism, and their plans. They worked in secret covert operations to prevent communist dictators from rising to power. Now, the CIA wasn't super friendly, okay? They're not, it's not as fun as, uh, you know, James Bond makes it look. They're willing to get their hands really dirty. And they're willing to do a lot of bad things to stop communism. These are the people that do bad things so that we don't have to even know that they did bad things. For example, in Iran, which is a country in the Middle East, the Prime Minister Mohammad Mossadegh tried to nationalize the oil industry. That means he wanted to take all the oil companies in Iran and make them under the control of the government of Iran. Now, the government taking control of private industries, that sounds like communism. So the CIA backed a coup that took over Iran, got rid of Mossadegh, and brought a new dictator into power named Shah Mohammad Reza Pahlavi. The Shah, as he was called, was a dictator but he liked capitalism. So the United States would rather have a dictator that was capitalist than a democracy that is communist. And so we kill a lot of people. We kick a lot of people out. We do a lot of bad things to keep communism from spreading that you'll probably never know about. For example, in Guatemala, there's a guy named Jacobo Arbenz. He promised to seize land in Guatemala and redistribute it back fairly to the peasants. That sounds like communism. He's got to go. CIA-backed soldiers come in and get rid of him. We would rather have autocrats rather than elected communists. In Cuba, the worst example of communism close to the United States is the communist revolution in Cuba in 1959 when Fidel Castro led a revolution to oust the U.S.-backed government in January 1959. And this scares the United States because all of a sudden there's communism right on our doorstep. Well, we'll talk about that hopefully in our next lesson as we learn about the 1960s. In the meantime, we need to talk about mass retaliation again. That's that idea that we are going to overwhelm anyone who tries to attack us with nukes. The Cold War gets scarier and scarier as the 1950s goes on. An American spy plane, we're not going to talk about that, but we have a spy plane that gets shot down. It's a big incident. But in the 1950s, Joseph Stalin, the leader of the Soviet Union, dies, and a new leader comes to power. His name is Nikita Khrushchev, and he pushes Russia to develop space exploration technology. And the first satellite ever is Sputnik, launched by the Russians in 1957. And this terrifies America because it looks like Russia is ahead of us technologically. If they can put a satellite into space, they could put bombs in space. So we need to have satellites ourselves so we can put bombs in space too. And for this reason, we create the National Aeronautical and Space Administration, or NASA, to develop space technology to compete with and surpass the Russians. Now, we're getting, we're getting close to wrapping up, but throughout the 1950s, most of the culture is focused on idealizing, conforming to dominant white middle-class culture. What that means is everybody wants to be like the Beavers, the Beaver family, or the Cleaver family, leave it to Beaver. Everybody wants to be that white middle-class family that has a good amount of money, they have that perfect little life. But if you're not like that, the 1950s isn't really that welcoming to you. If you're different, if you're a communist, if you're black, if you're Hispanic, those same opportunities don't apply to you, okay? Poverty rates for African-Americans in the 1950s is twice the race of whites. Uh, rate of whites. And in the South, segregation is the law of the land, and segregation very strictly separates black and white people in society and keeps black people as second-class citizens in the South. 
So when people talk about the good old days, the 1950s, they're usually white. And they're usually thinking about the time, and they may not even realize it, but they're usually thinking about the time when white people dominated society in America and African Americans suffered as a result. Latino Americans are deported by the millions in the 50s, and the United States government tried to get rid of the American Indian Reservation System, although that was not entirely successful. A lot of people rebelled against the conformity. Artists, musicians, intellectuals reviled the materialism, racism, and just the downright you know, uniformity in American society. Some people just didn't like the fact, that, why is everybody gonna be the same? Why does every house have to be the same? Why does everybody have to watch the same TV shows? Why does everyone have to be like everyone else? There's a lot of people who wanna be different. And this different culture is known as a counterculture. A counterculture is the culture that runs against the grain. Everybody's going this way, the counterculture is going the other way. The most famous example of a counterculture is the hippies of the 1960s. And we're not gonna talk about them yet, but the people who preceded the hippies are the beat generation. They celebrated African-American culture. They said, forget trying to be rich, let's celebrate poverty. They you know, used alcohol, drugs, and they had sexually active lifestyles. Intellectuals used books to criticize the dominance of white males and the power of military leaders and munition manufacturers in society. The military kind of started running the show. And there's a lot of, you know, regret in the United States in the 1950s among intellectuals, okay? One of the books that captures this is J.D. Salinger's The Catcher in the Rye, which is all about the idea of losing your innocence. And after World War II, it's like the United States has lost its innocence. And some people are just trying to forget about it and just focus on TV and having a new house and the economy. But some bad things happened during World War II. And some people just try to forget that it even happened. But there's scars that are still on the population from it. Now, teenagers during the 1950s, they are doing their regular old teenage thing and rebelling against social norms, and it gets celebrated in Hollywood films like James Dean's Rebel Without a Cause. And young people start doing things that young people always do, especially outside of marriage and especially in defiance of their elders. But with that, we come to the end of our study about the 1950s and the early Cold War. So, Thank you for paying attention. Thank you for watching this video. If you would like, leave a comment and let me know, you know what you think about the video. Let me know if there's anything I could do differently to make these videos easier to understand or do them better. I appreciate you watching and I appreciate your participation. I plan on, make sure you continue to do your homework assignments through the smart book on the Blackboard. Um, once I get the test graded, you should be able to see your grades on Blackboard. Remember, you may have heard some things about the grading policy changing for the rest of the year for your grades for your regular classes. Do not think that you can just forget about this class, okay? Because you are getting college credit for this class. So I'm gonna to continue to give you grades. Uh, my plan is to continue running the year like this. You're still expected to finish your final paper on time and you're still expected to do your final exam. Although I would probably recommend that you call the person that you're gonna interview instead of interviewing them in person to keep in with all the social distancing guidelines, okay? If you have any questions about that, please send me an email or call me. Uh, you know what to do and I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you for paying attention and I want you all to go do good things, be good people, make good choices. Thank you, I'll see you later.